15 minutes. Um, so as Mark said, um, I'm really keen to take this opportunity in the next 15 minutes to talk to you and to pick up on a lot of the elements that um, Alan was talking about. Um, to pick up on this, this policy area of community resilience, it's a big buzzword at the moment. Um, there's been a definite shift in the past few years in terms of the language that's used around resilience and the expectation that's placed um, upon communities but also upon government in getting communities to a particular point uh, in being resilient. Um, in speaking to you though, and coming to you from a, from a research perspective, um, I'm actually keen to avoid phrases such as the one that you can see before you. Um, while I agree wholeheartedly with the fact that um, community resilience is an extremely complex issue, um, I do find that a lot of reports tend to either start with this, uh, this, phrase, this kind of phrasing about the complexity of resilience, or finish with that phrasing. Um, and while, again, it's true, I don't think it's particularly useful at this point in time when government agencies are being asked to actually deliver on improving community resilience. So I've been thinking about this issue and trying to work out, well, actually, how can we get some practical um, advice and practical research to get people started on this journey towards resilient communities. So I just want to talk to you about uh, three, three main elements in this talk. Um, the first one is basically just to cover off on the policy context. So how do we get to this position that we're in now? Why are um, communities and, and governments being asked to deliver on this different kind of resilience at the moment? Um, then I'll speak very briefly on understanding the issue of resilience. Um, again, it's much talked about, a lot of language used around it, um, a lot of buzzwords, but my sense, having recently come across from uh, working in government, is that while the words are used, the in-depth understanding of what that actually means, and what does that mean to us as a government agency, and what does it mean to a community, there's a bit of a, a vacuum there. And finally, I'll, I'll finish on um, trying to define some research approaches. So once we have an idea of what's needed to create resilience, uh, as Alan quite rightly said, research is necessary to get people started and also to evaluate along the way. Now this is worth looking at, just to sit, sit there and uh, look at these words for a few minutes. Um, this is taken from the, um, the National, what's it called, the Nas National Strategy for Disaster Resilience, which was released in 2011. Uh, this is a paragraph that I've taken from there. Um, and I think it's interesting to look at those words, because if you compare this with a few years ago, I think, and which I tried to do, it's very actually very hard to find old policy documents on the internet, if you take them off. Um, the language is very different. Um, there's a lot of responsibility in there, togetherness. Um, obviously, resilience is in there. Um, so, the language has really changed in terms of policy documents that we're dealing with at the moment. And the reason that that's come about um, is that it's been driven by, on the one hand, disaster. So we have a burgeoning global population, a growing population in Australia. That basically means that there are more people in the way of events. Um, it, it may or may not mean that there are more events happening, um, although climate predictions are um, quite clearly saying that there will be more extreme um, climatic events in the future. But at the same time, we've got to put more people standing in the way of events. And that generally means more disaster in the future. And part of this realisation is that governments can't cope with these major disasters. When they, happen, when they really happen, when they happen big, um, there's, there's just a, a real limit to what governments can cope with. But I think also within this policy context, there's a realisation that we're living with a, a highly networked, glo globalised world, where an incident on one side of the earth can cause significant changes for people on the other side of the world. For instance, if Qantas were to take their, um, take their engineers offshore uh, due to market, uh, market forces, um, that would have potentially significant <coughs> effects on communities in Australia. Um, and all of these disruptions can have impacts on communities. So there's a real um, keenness out there to be able to protect and um, enable communities to be resilient to these kinds of changes and disruptions. 
So, in response to this, um, and, and globally, this has been this has been occurring. Um, there's been a real change in the language um, of responsibility to cope with these disruptions and disasters. So, for instance, in the UK, uh, in March this year, the Cabinet Office released um, a new framework on community resilience, and the language around that. Um, I'll read it out to you. There'll be times when individuals and communities are affected by an emergency that are not in immediate danger and will have to look after themselves and each other for a period until any necessary external assistance can be provided. Now, previously, saying look after yourselves was not a very palatable thing to do politically. Now it's okay to say that. Um, in Australia this year, the National Strategy for Disaster Resilience was released and um, I've based a lot of this uh, the thinking and the presentation on the wording and the choices that have been made within this policy document. And again, same kind of language. Disaster resilience is based on individuals taking their share of responsibility for preventing, preparing for, responding to, and recovering from disasters. And I heard this week also about a, a website that's just come up, uh, being created in Queensland by the Green Cross, which is called Harden Up Queensland. So uh, that's really taking it to the next extreme. But it's now acceptable to say, Harden Up, you've got to look after yourselves. You can't expect government to look after you when things really hit the fan. So, now I'll just talk briefly about understanding this issue of resilience. Um, Ipsos have created, um, using all the data that's available, um, created a map which actually maps community resilience hotspots around Victoria. It's a really good um, tool that you can use for a lot of your strategy creation um, and identifying where resources can be placed. At this point, some of you will be thinking, that's fantastic, that's exactly what we need. And some of you will be thinking, that guy's lying. <laughs> the people who chose me as a liar would be correct. We haven't been able to create this. <laughs> it's pretty much impossible to do that at this level. It's been tried, and uh, with, with the information available, it's just not possible. The reason being that with um, data, statistics, even just going into communities and having a look at them, it's really hard to tell whether they're resilient or not, or how resilient they may be, or how resilient they may not be. So I'll ask you just to look at these clips and have a think about whether you think this community is resilient or not resilient. So in this situation, they may be innovative, they may be adaptable, but they look quite vulnerable. <laughs> So they have some things going for them, but others are not. In the Australian situation, we have, in many cases, affluent, educated society. So a lot going for people. They can, they can buy, the, buy their way out of um, trouble if they need to. But they're also dependent. They're highly dependent upon government. They're highly dependent upon uh, emergency <coughs> services, which is a weakness. So are they a resilient community or not? Uh, in this example, you may have a very close-knit community, really well-bonded, with shared goals. But the fact that they have poor access to resources, um, unfortunately, is a mark against them in terms of um, whether they're resilient. And this can all be argued with. I'm giving you my idea of whether these communities are resilient or not. You may have your own story. This situation, where you have um, people developing en masse, uh, without the leadership of government, uh, without any regulation and without any protection. Um, this, puts, this makes them extremely vulnerable, as we quite often see. But at the same time, it makes them very independent. They have no expectation that the government is going to come along and help them uh, in a disaster. So in that situation, it's likely that they'll pick themselves up and get on with things pretty quickly after a disaster. No expectation that some outside force is going to come and save them. And in other cases, people just roll with, roll with it and like to have fun. And uh, before you have any worries about privacy, my family were really happy. 